Awesome. And if you guys um, wouldn't mind muting yourself during this, that would be great. That way, that way the recording won't have any background noise in it. Awesome. Well, everybody, I'm so excited to share with you guys tonight. Um, as with anything, High Country Doulas loves to help give parents the information that they need to be able to navigate that journey of um, becoming a parent and what all that involves and it's always ever changing. So the information that you find tonight should be um, helpful in um, getting you prepared and ready to be able to travel with your children um, as an infant and also as they get a little bit bigger. So my name is Allison Rollins and I am the owner um, of High Country Doulas. I really love work supporting parents through this whole journey of parenthood. And um, High Country Doulas does support parents during pregnancy, birth, and beyond. We work with parents to support their birth experience in those early days of feeding and comforting your baby and helping you know kind of what comes next. So let's go ahead and get started. One more slide over. All right, so you've made your plans to get, um, get yourself and your family off to a destination. Maybe you're going to visit family. Maybe you are um, trying to um, make a trip with family to a destination. Um, that could include car rides, bus rides, cab fare, all those kind of things. And I think it's really important to kind of be prepared so that you can help your children at whatever age they are to feel more calm and comfortable during that journey. And also to make sure that you yourself are cared for because we know that um, vacations, as we say, taking a family vacation, um, I call it making memories because it's really not necessarily a vacation. <laughs> Even though you will have downtime, and some less responsibility, oftentimes parents will come back ready to have a vacation from their vacation. But that's just, that's just being a parent. So um, one of the things I think is important is just that fear of the unknown of what to expect. But taking your kid, on, your kid and your child on that adventure doesn't necessarily have to be stressful. So let's talk a little bit more um, to help you guys understand how you can have a better stress-free uh, experience. Um, not completely stress-free, of course, but as stress-free as possible. And today we're gonna um, focus on two types of travel. So we're gonna talk about car and air, and we're gonna talk about the tips um, that can help you adapt to those forms. So you may be doing both during your journeys or not. But these two, these, um, this information can be translated to other forms of transportation like bus or train if you're doing that as well. And I do want to mention right here and right now that there is a webinar. It's called Child Passenger Safety. And this webinar is specific to um, helping ensure that you have the right equipment with you when you are navigating um, any type of travel with your child, car, bus, plane, train, and the specific safety recommendations for those car seats specific to your child's age, if that makes sense. So there's a whole nother thing. And it's at our High Country Doulas YouTube channel. You can find it on there. So just Google it. All right, let's get started. All right. awesome. So traveling um, with infants. Um, um, one important factor to remember is what age are they? You know, um, also another factor is their temperament. Children have different temperaments. And if you just have one child, you're learning that child's temperament. Um, so when your second child comes along, um, most likely that child will not have the same temperament as your um, first child. But for many families that traveling by car may be less stressful type of travel if your little one enjoys car rides and they do well. Others may have infants who just hate the car seat. I have three children. I had two who really liked it. My third child, my son hated it. He does not like 
any, you know, until he was a little bit older, he didn't like being strapped in and maybe not being able to see and those kind of things. And no matter how many like um, silly faces my older daughter made for him, he was not happy. <laughs> so lots of different things. If you're planning a big trip um, after you've welcomed your new baby, um, some things to consider is doing what we call a trial run um, before traveling longer distances. Um, Claire mentioned that before, that taking a shorter trip first to kind of see how it goes. Sometimes you can just do that around your um, area. Um, typically we take similar lengths of trips and when we're navigating, just going out and about our town, but extending those um, to experiment how your kid does with them can sometimes be helpful to know how to prepare. Right. So, if your baby does well around, around town driving in your car, um, you kind of double that length of trip um, to be able to see how they manage it. So temperament and age of baby is gonna be big factors on this. So it's just important also while you're doing that is to keep in mind your baby's schedule. Um, when you're planning your destination of that first trial run, be sure to factor in a stop for a feed and a diaper change. If you do have more of a predictable schedule, um, look at a nice place for stopping and changing to make um, that overall experience run smoothly. Important to know, if your baby is sensitive to car rides, consider um, seating either an older sibling or an adult in the back with them to help them feel more secure. You may want to consider um, scheduling your travel, your trial runs around your baby's nap or sleep times. Babies will typically tra travel better um, if they sleep in the car. My husband and I, with three children, we would have seven hour drives. Um, we would leave at, you know, like after dinner or when we knew that they were all going to be at peace or semi at peace. <laughs> Much easier on us, at least. A little bit of lack of sleep. Um, wasn't um, as important to us as having a calm ride. <laughs> so it may be necessary for you to allow for sort of a slower buildup of longer rides in the car for your babies um, if they are easily upset. So shorter trips of 30 or 60 minutes um, may be initially required. Awesome. All right. So helping you to um, figure out how to comfort your baby. When you travel during the day, consider investing in um, sunshades. If you don't already have tinted windows on your car or your tinted windows on your car are not super strong, uh, uh, many of the van vans have those screens and stuff that you can do. But I remember like back in the day, um, we used to roll up like receiving blankets into um, the window to be able to screen them. But it can really help diffuse that direct sunlight to help babies and it helps also with their temperature too. Right. So car travel when your kid gets a little bit older, um, six months or older, planning your travel to be more relaxed terms of scheduling, meaning that your child is on the move, they're either sitting up or they're crawling. It is important to kind of remember that your baby is going to need more activity time, more frequent stops might be needed. So you may wanna schedule more time to get to the location that you're trying to get to via car. Kind of planning those stops around like meal times or snack breaks can help um, give your child some time to get out of the car seat and move around. Um, if they're older and they're potty training, that's another factor. <laughs> so um, a picnic can be great um, idea. So taking, um, taking a cooler with some food to allow your baby to stretch and move their, move their body along the way. Awesome. So one of the things that's really important is that babies get bored, um, especially older, the older they are, they will tend to get bored. Um, so when traveling with them, it's really can be more challenging to keep them occupied during that awake time. 
And older babies usually are more engaged with their environments, like their vision has stretched out, they're seeing further out, and they're interested in what they're seeing. So if they don't have a lot of view from their car seat, that might um, cause them to be more fussy. So allowing them to have um, toys that you can rotate through um, to be able to entertain them along the way, or having that adult sitting in the back with them and talking to them. Sometimes this can be a little tricky because sometimes it will cause, <laughs> it will cause a baby to want to get out um, and they may fuss. So just saying that if, um, think about which partner would be a better suit to sit in the back for that, um, sometimes they'll be more fussier for one than they will the other. Um, it, especially for a breastfeeding mom, sometimes they will be more fussy because they want you to comfort them. And that means they think that you're going to feed them. So just a couple of insights there. All right. Um, one thing to note is, uh, I don't really think they make these anymore, but they used to make sort of toy bars for um, on the car seat. And those are really not safe for um, children's travel as they um, can hit the child in case of an accident, just the way like this toy right here that this little boy is holding is a, is a plastic toy. It would become a projectile. So it, if you're going to choose toys, try and choose things that are either secured down or have um, a soft softness to them of some kind, All right? And they won't be as heavy, All right? So meal times and snack times. Kids are hungry a lot, so they <laughs> they're kind of like you know pregnant or postpartum women. We need to snack our blood sugar drops. So it's important when you're traveling by car to be able to um, um, note that bottle propping is not a good thing for, for babies younger than one year old um, being unsupervised. Babies that are older than that can kind of hold their bottle on their own, but um, if your baby becomes hungry during travel, um, pull over to a safe place and be able to offer to breastfeed them or feed them a bottle, um, or you can be in the back with them feeding them a bottle. It's really cons considered the most safe. If your child is eating in the back, it's the safest to have another adult back there with them in that case, because we know they do need to be able to have snacks. Another note is when you're transporting um, formula or breast milk, make sure that you follow the um, recommendations for safe storage. If you don't have that information, be sure to email me at info at High Country Doulas and I can send that to you. Um, you may want um, kind of to have a small pack of cooler for your snacks and things. And this is talking about baby. I never want to leave out moms and dads because you <laughs> have to take care of yourself too. So we need to make sure that in that cooler that we pack things for ourselves as well. So toddlers, you guys may or may not have toddlers at this moment, but traveling with toddlers, entertainment is number one. Um, toddlers are highly mobile. They want to explore. They are into their bodies and they're ready to move. So um, if you have ever been around the toddler, you know that pretty much from the time that they're awake, they are moving <laughs> and, and unless they're sleeping, they're, they're still then, but otherwise they're moving. So it's really important to take breaks and to be able to have space for your baby to have movement um, during that. Bringing along um, that um, child's favorite toys, um, potentially setting aside some new ones. One of my girlfriends many years back, she would go to Goodwill and get little tiny plastic toys and stick them in the dishwasher and wash them, put them in a crate and leave them for her car rides to go visit her parents because it was all new toys. And so she didn't want to spend a lot of money, but she knew that the kids needed something. I had another friend who, <laughs> um, her kids were a little bit older, but boxes of Band-Aids. I mean, the kids have to open rip into them, then they have to take off the little things, and then they stick them all over, <laughs> over themselves. But things to occupy them that are fun and safe. Awesome. Oops. So favorite toys, um, some um, 
parents will engage babies of this age with um, screen time. So if you have a device um, where you can load um, some activities or some videos for your children um, during this time to help them manage that time, awake time in the car is good. Another important key factor is um, potty training. So your children may not be in this state, but when you have a kid who is potty training, they don't realize they need to go till right then when they need to go. And sometimes you don't even have time to pull over. I have a really good um, friend who told me, she's like, in my van, I keep a little travel, you know, just a little kid potty um, with a closed lid because it was important. They did a lot of time, spend a lot of time in the car traveling um, just because they lived kind of out of town. So that was a lifesaver for her and for her kids to be able to not freak out um, about that whole situation, which some kids can really do. All right, older kids um, definitely go longer periods of time before they get restless. Um, older kids are much more verbal. They are gonna be chatting and talking. They want music, they want all kinds of things. So they are able to more self-entertain and you can engage those kids with fun car games, right? If you raise your hand, if you played car games growing up, right before the time we had smartphones, <laughs> there was only the radio, no car phones, um, only like pay phones. So you um, played a lot of games and those are still really fun for kids. Kids really um, love being able to experience those with their family. And as I mentioned before, we are trying to make memories in our adventures with our kids. So a couple ones to note, um, definitely we can't do punch buggy anymore, but if you know other cars like minis that are out there that they can um, identify, I wouldn't recommend it with certain kids or siblings because that might get a little crazy, but the license plate game, so finding out the states, if you're traveling uh, on an interstate where you're gonna see a lot of license tags, that's really fun. Um, the alphabet game, so that's where you are um, finding something that starts with A and you say it and everybody has their own, everybody um, has to find their own things. They can't find the same thing. So A is it for Applebee's um, and so on and so on. All right. Um, older children will also need to be able to get out of the car and burn off energy. So even though they are able to sit easier and be less whiny, even though sometimes they still are, um, they need movement and that's gonna help them burn off some of that energy that gets pinned up for long trap car rides. All right, so how many of you enjoy flying? How many of you guys have maybe a fear of flying? Um, sometimes parents have a fear um, of flying now that they have babies and that is a real fear. So um, helping you with that fear would be, um, comes along with the importance of planning and being prepared for that so that you have less anxiety when it comes to traveling with your child uh, on an airplane. All right, so let's talk about that travel with infants. So traveling by plane um, presents many choices, right, for you and then also possible difficulties. And we're gonna take a look at some of those more common um, concerns and challenges. A couple of those common concerns would be getting to the airport. So are you gonna park your car? Are you going to leave it there? And then are you gonna take the bus shuttle? Are you gonna have a friend who's gonna drop you off right at the entrance? Managing that and knowing that it's gonna take you a lot longer than it would pre-baby, so pre-children. <laughs> um, buying um, your baby their own seat versus them as a lap child. And the regulations still are, if your child is under two, they can sit with you in your lap. And this works a lot of the times for parents um, who are, don't have very long flights um, and feel comfortable with that. If you don't feel comfortable with that, then buy your kid a seat right next to you and um, you can bring on your car seat um, if it is a certified car seat um, that is certified for what we call FFA 
restrictions. So that's good to know. Um, sometimes you will be traveling with your child with a car seat so that you can have it when you're there. And a couple of things to note that many of the families I've worked with have experienced for themselves is that you, your car seat is gonna get tossed around in the plane, right? So buying a cheap bag that you can put it in and um, maybe if it's a really fancy, nice car seat, maybe not taking that one <laughs> if you're gonna be checking that car seat. So I hope that makes sense to you, but if you're gonna have the car seat on the plane with you, just know that it needs to be appropriate for travel on airplanes. And it will say that in the, on the tag on the safety um, recommendations for your, on the car seat itself. So traveling with snacks and formula. So we do worry about traveling with food and are they gonna check that? We're gonna learn more about that. We're also gonna talk about delays, um, traveling from your destination. And we're also gonna talk about keeping track of toddlers and older children. So lots of things to um, know and understand as you make your plans. All right, we're gonna get to the airport, right? Um, when traveling with those infants and toddlers who are still using car seats to travel by car um, safely, you will want to give some thought into how you're going to get to the airport, both leaving and returning home from your adventure. If you plan to leave your vehicle parked in the airport long-term parking, you may be able to drive yourself and park and go from there. But if you won't if you won't be parking your car at the airport, consider having a friend or a family member um, um, join you on the trip from your home to the airport so they can return um, your car after the departure. Um, so what about car seats? So this is important. So we are going to take a look at um, those in just a few minutes. I've talked a little bit about them, but we're gonna talk a little bit more about the importance of car seats when it comes to flying. All right. So when I had um, first traveled with my um, first child on the plane, I chose to have her as a lap baby. And at that point she was still nursing. So I was able to have her in my lap and help her um, with comforting and calming her and feeding her and helping her with the air pressure. Um, from nursing. So she had that as an option. So age of your baby um, is a factor, um, but um, lap travel can be comfortable for many um, parents. And there are um, a couple of things to note that are really important. So let's talk a little bit about them. So the Federal Av Aviation Administration policy on lap travel allows toddlers up to age two to fly for free in a parent's lap. However, they do strongly encourage that you have um, used child restraints such as air travel approved car seats. Um, so they recommend, but then they allow. There are um, um, re child restraint seats um, available out there that you can purchase for takeoff and lift off. Um, and turbulence that attach to you um, if you want them. Those are things that you can look into on your own. And um, some parents feel like that that's not important to them and others really do. So it's sort of that um, you're not really sure if you wanna buy a seat for your kid, but you wanna have some kind of um, support system for them. Um, because it is important to know that your child you are not capable no longer if you're the strongest man to be able to hold your child securely in the case of a, unexpected turbulence. So that's just really important to like think about. It's also important like if you're traveling with by yourself with your child or if you have a partner or several people, um, you may be able to, you know, have that child move from lap to lap so that you're not the only one holding that and then also how long is your flight um, do you have to change planes a lot will you have a break or is it a really long flight will they need to sleep during that time so 
All right, so the safest place again is um, in an approved child safety restraint system um, or device, um, just to note that. And I think I've already talked about that, so let's move on. Okay, this is what I mentioned before, is your car seat approved for flying? So once you've decided how you wanna approach um, your seating on the plane, you'll need to give some thought into your car seat. Um, if you've decided to buy your young child their own seat, you need to make sure that they have a seat that is approved. And seats that are approved, of course, will have a sticker. It'll say this restraint is certified for use in motor vehicles and aircraft, okay? If your current car seat does not have that, right, you may want to consider buying a second um, seat for your trip. You can um, buy a used seat. It just needs to be um, um, fairly new. Um, so like um, here in Boone at Bluebird Exchange, um, there are car seats there that you can buy that are still safe, haven't been in accidents, but are um, fairly new and haven't been recalled. So that's another thing. You could possibly borrow one from somebody, but um, the booster seats, according to the FFA, booster seats and harnesses. Um, harness vests enhance the safety of vehicles. Um, however, the FFA prohibits passengers from using these types of restraints. So it's really tricky here. I think it's most important that you talk to um, whatever airline you're traveling with. Does that make sense? Because they used to hand out like these little restraint systems that you could put on um, to attach your child to yourself um, during takeoff and landing. Does that make sense? So calling them and finding them out or checking out on their website will be most important. Um, they just don't, um, not all of those provide the best um, protection for you. All right. So we mentioned this before, traveling, um, snacks and formula, and then the strollers issue. So um, some of us may use um, some type of baby wearing device to help support our ch child. We may have several different strollers or devices um, like that. And trying to make a decision of what's important to take with you um, can, um, can be sort of a factor of like, are you changing planes a lot? Could your stuff get lost? Um, are you going to be checking those at the gate or will you be checking those when you check in? Um, when will you need that again? And those kind of things. But nutrition is probably the most essential thing. Um, if you're bottle feeding or breastfeeding or bottle feeding with breast milk, um, knowing those guidelines and transporting formula and express milk is important. So um, formula and breast milk and juice are exempt from what we call the 311 liquids rule, um, according to um, the TSA. So when you arrive, you just need to notify the agent as you're going through security that you have those liquids on you, okay? So basically TSA says when screening formula, breast milk and juice, the officers will need to test the liquids for explosives or concealed prohibited items. Officers may ask you to open those containers. Um, you have, a, you, um, have you transfer a small amount of liquid into a separate empty container or dispose of a small quantity if feasible, okay? Um, inform the people that you, if you do not want the formula, breast milk or juice to be x-rayed or opened, so let them know that. Additional steps will be taken to approve the liquid and you and the travel guardian, right, will undergo additional screening procedures. This can include like pat down, screening of other carry on property, um, those kind of things. When it comes to traveling with a stroller, um, it can make navigating the airport much more efficient and save on some undue wear and tear on you holding your baby. So think about how much your baby weighs, how long you're gonna be holding them, and also consider that you might have a delay and what, what that would look like. So if your baby is mobile, sometimes it's a great way to keep your baby safe and be able to move them around. 
um, the smaller and simpler the stroller, the easier it is to navigate. So even though we love those big strollers that have lots of space underneath them, sometimes a tinier stroller that can be um, folded up really small and left um, right as you're getting on the plane can be really easy. They're not very expensive. And um, if you need to replace it, if it gets bent, it, you're not like out a lot of money. So um, they can be put through the x-ray machine and strollers can also be, you know, checked in at the gate. So really helpful. Um, I often um, kind of decide how long, um, how many checks you're going to get and how, um, how long you're going to, you could potentially be because if the baby's smaller, it might be easier for you to have them as in a baby wearing device. Um, so, or if they're moving and they need to walk around, that might look a lot differently. You definitely, um, the more stuff you have, the less fast you can move around the airport <laughs> for sure. And the less stuff you have, the less, um, I guess, less your back's gonna be hurting afterwards. So thinking about air travel and delays. So that is a reality. Um, they are no fun for anybody, but they can be especially stressful when you have little ones. So try and minimize these chances of, of delay by booking a nonstop flight or direct flight when possible. Um, or you can plan your travel with the fewest number of stops possible. Some families might um, find it more economical to take a red eye. So if you're traveling across country, taking a red eye might be a good um, choice. However, just be aware that these flights can take longer to arrive at the destination and could include overnight layovers. Um, so keeping your little one entertained during those delays. I remember having my child who was just around the year and we were traveling alone on a plane across country. And so she, she and I got delayed and it was pretty miserable. Um, and I remember she handled it beautifully, probably better than I did. And I remember we walked past one of the little stores or kiosk, kiosk and she saw Elmo. And she, she was very verbal um, early. And I remember her saying Elmo. And so she got, she ended up getting an Elmo doll, you know, just a little one, <laughs> not anything big, but because she was just a champ. Um, so sometimes they surprise you in their ability to navigate all that much less stress than sometimes their parents are. Um, some things that you can do though, to keep your little one entertained during the delays, um, like find a quiet corner um, where you're at the gate where you can allow your child to burn off some energy. They're not running in front of other people or bothering other people, but try to find a little area. Even if it's not at the gate that you're at, if you need to move to a closer gate, because you're going to hear those, um, you're going to hear or within seeing distance of when you're going to be boarding. Um, so sometimes that can make it just a little bit easier. Um, taking them for walks up and down the terminal, so taking turns with that can sometimes be helpful, um, and just being mindful of them becoming overtired, because typically they're going to have a harder time sleeping if they miss their naps during that time. So just note, um, sometimes that can be helpful when you have that stroller, <laughs> um, but not all kids feel comfortable with um, sleeping in that situation. It just depends on the kid. But as a general rule to note, early morning flights often have the um, smallest chance of delay, if that helps. Right. So traveling from your destination. Before you leave, just definitely give some thought about um, for when you arrive at your destination. So within the itinerary, it, within your itinerary, I can't talk, um, allow time to collect bags from the baggage claim and um, then get to your next stop. So if you're renting a car, make sure that the vehicle can accommodate um, your car seat for your child. And if you, <clears throat> if you've checked that, you know, it's going to be on the, um, on the um, luggage baggage claim. All right. If you're taking public transit for some reason, allow time to navigate um, with the added load of a baby stroller and possible car seat. 
again, like if you've never traveled with traveled with children, it's a huge change. Um, you know, if you were that like person who was running to the gate to catch their flight, you can't always do that with children. So definitely allowing more time and being there um, ahead of time um, to make sure that you get there and you're not stressed out. Um, all right. Just note that another thing is that once you arrive, sometimes everybody can be really tired and emotions are running high. So sometimes giving, um, when you're able to get a treat, just make sure everybody has enough water or hydrated. That can be a huge, huge impact on everyone involved if they don't, if they're getting dehydrated. And it can make jet lag and um, those travel pains much worse if you're dehydrated. All right, so keeping track of toddlers and older children. I will note, um, you know, people have a huge worry when they're in big crowds of, you know, having a child, especially if you have a wandering child. Um, this is something that we all deal with as parents. But the most basic approach is to hold your child's hand, right? Or have them strapped into a stroller or wearing them or something like that. Um, there are alternatives to that. So if your kids gets older and kids tend to wander, it's totally normal, <laughs> not for all kids, but some kids, um, parents may really dislike them, but they do have wrist cup cuffs available, backpacks that they, that like toddlers wear that you have a cord to and it's strapped to your um, wrist as an added security um, in our high tech world. There are, um, GPS tracking devices called um, like ones called angel sits. These help parents feel more relaxed um, traveling through busy locations. So they're kind of a locator. And I will send everybody email with that information in case that's something that you're really interested in. If your child is old enough to have a smartphone, um, smartphone users can use Life360 and different, um, I think a Apple has a app to be able to locate course it does only locate the phone not necessarily the kid <laughs> awesome. all right and I mentioned those resources a couple of them are um, I will send those via email the TSA um, in strollers the FA FFA statement on lap travel I'll send in there um, the information on tracking devices um, also 25 tips that for traveling with children and that life um, 360 app i also have a wonderful handout for you guys so i will email that for you as well and thanks so much for joining me i really love to share information so that you can have a better experience um, when you are traveling with your ch child or whatever you're doing with your family. So I hope you've enjoyed tonight's webinar. Again, we do have a child passenger safety webinar that is on our High Country Doula's YouTube channel. So check that out if you wanna learn more about um, what, um, what child safety devices is right for your child at different ages and how to um, know and make those choices. So that's really good. And it talks a little bit about transportation as well. So there's a little bit of overlap. All right, I am going to stop sharing my screen and let's chat a little bit and make sure everybody's questions are answered. I hope everybody's still with us. Did I put you all to sleep? <laughs> no, it was great, thank you. We had to leave, but. Oh, yeah. Is it sleepy time? Nap time. Nap time, yes. No, bath, bath. Oh, bath time. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Got to have bath time. I love nighttime routines. It's so much fun. <laughs> so much fun. Oh, so special. They grow up so fast. I know sometimes it's stressful being the parent, but it's definitely, it's definitely also very special. Oh, goodness. Well, um, thank y'all for joining me. Let's take some time and answer some questions um, to make sure everybody kind of walks away. I do have um, this little um, checklist here that has um, what to make sure that you take for baby. Um, so just things like making sure you have you know, how many changes of clothes do you need to take and be prepared for for your child? Um, 
you know, having um, a pacifier. So if you're not breastfeeding, your child will need to like suck on something to help with the pressure for airplane travel with their ears. So that could be a sippy cup swallowing just so they have that open jaw so it pops their ears. And, um, you know, there's just lots of things on here like a changing pad, um, making sure you have a blanket. Sometimes, you know, if you do get a delay and you need to lay your kid down to play, there's really no space for, you know, in an airport besides the floor for your kid to lay on. So it's nice to have a, a receiving blanket lightweight and you can lay it out and let them play um, because you know once you get on the plane they're not going to be able to do that so little things like that um, I always say that with travel especially on a plane um, where you may want to limit your amount of things that you're traveling with there's always things that kids um, typically especially older kids that can their vision is extended they're going to get entertained they're going to get entertained by people by just objects along the way cups that you get you know <laughs> with your drink and stuff and they'll play with that so it's really not necessary to pack a whole bunch of stuff if you're traveling via airplane with cars it and you have if you have room you can definitely um, have more room for traveling different um, toys and entertainment things as they get older but I can email you guys this information. There's also information about in here on um, beach, so beach travel, because you mentioned that, Claire. I have a couple of tips specifically for beach travel. And, um, you know, some of those um, you might find really helpful. I think um, it's sort of as we take our infants to the beach, it's like testing the waters. Um, whether you're a really love the beach, right, and you want to spend a lot of time, like if you're used to spending all day on the beach, that can be very different with a, a baby because a baby may not be able to handle the heat and the sun. Even if you have an umbrella or a baby shade, you, having somebody else there who can um, take the baby in and you get to have some adult time can be really helpful and don't be scared to ask for that um, if you don't have other people traveling with you um, sometimes you trade off or spending more time on the beach in the time of the day that's less hot so um, where they you it's not as hot your baby's not going to be as cranky um, definitely children and sand <laughs> so there's a little bit of information here on um, things like oh goodness where were we talking about this I know it's on here somewhere. Oh, it's um, <laughs> kids get sand and they will, some baby, some kids will scream because it irritates them. If you guys have ever had sand in your pants and um, using things like cornstarch or baby powder or arrowroot powder can help with that um, abrasions on your kid. So uh, lots of little tips like that are on here making sure you have like a wagon of some kind or something to help take the beach toys out. I actually, I think it was with, I think it was with my second, it could have been with my third. I got plantar fasciitis because I was carrying my baby in a bunch of beach chairs. I was, ha I had my baby in a backpack carrying all that stuff and the weight um, on uh, walking barefoot on the sand messed my arches up and so I had plantar fasciitis from that and it was miserable <laughs> so just like things like that <laughs> I'm so crazy the baby powder you're saying uh, um after they got the sand or will that help kind of keep it yeah out of the um, so yeah so putting that on before can help with that with taking away the irritation but it can also help loosen that because you know things like knowing where the showers are so that you can get your kid to the showers but one of the things to note with children especially around water or the beach is that they um, are going to be um, pushing those boundary limits of um, they're tired and so they're much more likely to be overtired um, when it comes to having lots of fun right around water if the kid's having lots of fun around water they'll push past that and all of a sudden they'll just crash and if you mix um some sand irritation with overtired it's like <laughs> it's 
crazy. <laughs> so just making note of that um, and preparing, especially for older kids, like preparing them. Okay, we've got five more minutes. Um, we'll get to come back out later this afternoon, but right now we're going in because we need to eat because they'll push past like hunger. They'll push past everything when they're, when they're older to be able to play longer. And of course, as parents, we want to hang out more too, but then we end up um, dealing with fussy, fussy, tired, overtired kids if we don't um, manage that for sure. So I want to make sure, let's see, what other questions surrounding the beach, Claire, come to mind for you guys? Um, I know you're traveling with family. Yeah, that's that's the plan. We may go with just us too, but um, the trip this summer would be with family. Now, those were good tips, what you said. I mean, we don't have anything specific necessarily okay. in mind, but yeah. Yeah. So like um, knowing what's available at the place that you're going to, um, if especially if you haven't booked it, to know like, are there any, um, you know, things available for baby? Do I, what do I need to bring? And um, typically, if you're in the same space as other people, maybe making sure that you have a sound machine and things like that to cover up the noise that may be unfamiliar for her as far as sleep goes can be yeah. really helpful um, in regards to that, <laughs> for sure. Do you, know anything, do you know anything about like uh, putting sunscreen on kids, how young you can start using sunscreen? It's around six months. For, for children. Mm -hmm. And so, so before that, just shade, just keep them before shade. that shade and um, those big brim hats with the little tie underneath um, and just shorter periods, taking them out when the sun is not as um, intense during the day. Um, so going out, planning your days around that and um, making sure you have an umbrella, you know, because they can still play underneath all of those. And of course, for one month olds, they're not sitting up or doing anything like that. So if you have, um, if you're going out to the beach um, and you want to be able to have her laying down, you may think about bringing something out there to sit her in that would be more lightweight than like a car seat. Uh, otherwise, <clears throat> otherwise, she'll be laying on, the, on, on like a beach towel. And there's always sand on those for sure. We have this like little fold up, like pop out bassinet almost thing. Oh yeah. Really okay. I know what you're talking about. It has like sides to kind of block. Uh huh. Hopefully if it's windy, cause you know, a lot of times it is windy out there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That would probably be great. Um, for sure. That'll be helpful for something. Cause she's definitely going to need a space to lay down because you don't want yeah. to be there the whole time. So. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> so much fun. And Blake, um, as far as international travel goes, um, I do have a little bit of information here. Um, I think that definitely, um, I mentioned things about like trying to get a flight that has less changes can be really helpful um, it, for flying. Um, it, asking, always, always ask, because they're not gonna tell you sometimes. Some people are gonna be like, oh, you have a baby, here's what you can do. But sometimes they'll stick babies in the back of the plane. And that's the worst, especially if you have a flight to catch and you're stuck in the back. And they stick them in the back because they don't want the other people complaining if the baby cries. But you can get like the front row of economy where you have that extra space with the feet. Um, so depending on how far you book in advance for, for flights. And that can be really helpful, especially if it's a long flight. Um, yeah, a lot of people find that it's easier to check, um, check things at the gate. Another note is that your, your, if you have a breast pump or milk storage or a diaper bag, those don't count against you when it comes to carry-ons. Does that make sense? So if you had um, a carry-on that was a piece of luggage, um, you could still check a diaper bag um, and that, and probably like a purse if you wanted to. 
um, I know that a lot of people kind of combine their diaper bags with what they need purse wise because then you're just strapped down with all these things. <laughs> but it is good to know that. And checking your car seat um, and a stroller do not count against you um, for most airlines. So you should be able to check those um, on your boarding, like, you know, when you're getting, well, you don't really get your tickets anymore, but in that early stage before you go through. Um, security. So here's another thing. So airplane going through security. Um, I think typically the important aspects of going through airport security is to carry um, your milk, your pouches, um, liquid um, in like 100, I think that is it over 100 mls or something like that not be allowed to take I think that's right something like that but if um, typically um, they're not going to make a big fuss if it's for a baby so if you have formula or pumped milk um, you should be able to get through easily with that and you can also ask them to um, one of the moms that I talked to said that you can open them and and they will swab the air above the milk um, so that you don't have to pour any out if you don't need to. So, but definitely having extra. How about like temperature regulation is if you have breast milk, I guess, for your longer yeah. flights? Yeah, so um, their temperature regulations would be in breast milk storage guidelines. Um, the best place, um, an easy place for you to find that out is to go to kellymom.com backslash, I think it's breast milk storage guidelines, and um, they'll have that information on their website. It's an IBCLC run site. So if you have questions about that, um, for women who pump and travel, like if they're working, um, they get really nice um, cold packs that work um, and keep things cold for a long time. And um, so if you had to have a really long flight, you may have to, um, <laughs> you may have to figure something out with that. I don't know as far as traveling on a plane that they would allow you to put it anywhere, but you could probably um, be able to buy ice or have cold things on there. Breast milk, of course, is much more easily traveled than formula. Formula has sort of this like window and it's done. Um, especially if it's open, whether it's um, if it's powder and you and you mixing it, or if it's an opened bottle of pre-mixed formula, um, those are only going to be um, well in the refrigerator. It's like twenty, let's see, twenty-four hours. Um, but if they are have been fed and then back out, it has to be done within an hour. So big differences. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, I just wondered like if, if you're on an eight hour flight, those little cold packs, I, I guess they would let you take that on the flight, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Anything that has to do with breast milk, you shouldn't have a problem with getting. They just don't last very long at all. Um, the, the usual ones don't, but you can get really like stronger ones. So. The ones that are made like NASA, from NASA, NASA cold packs or something. Yeah, NASA cold packs. Um, the ones that are made um, through like Medela, um, they they come with like the pump and style. With there's some that have the freezer kit. Those last, I think, eight hours, or um, and because a lot of women who are like traveling for their job and they're pumping, they have to have um, they have to have cold packs that last for a long time. So they're out there. <laughs> <laughs> but um, you may just want to look at like your um, whatever breast pump you have. You could probably look on their website and find out what their cold packs, how long they last specifically. So, well, if anybody has any other questions, you know how to reach me and I will email you out those um, couple of resources that I mentioned and this little um, handy dandy handout and checklist and let me know if your travels go well or if you have any other tips that you'd like to share with other parents because I'm always here to take in information and share.
other parents so they can have a better experience. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yep. Thanks, Allison. Take care. All right. See you guys. Bye. Bye. All right. Bye-bye. Bye, Blake.